Welcome to Electron Online, and now we're going to talk about non-ideal gases and how that fits into our PV equals NRT equation. So, so far we've assumed that all gases we're dealing with are what we call ideal. And what that really means is that we consider the volume that the actual molecules occupy in the container is so small compared to all the space between the, the molecules that we can just ignore it. Secondly, we also ignored the inter uh, activity, the electrical activity between the molecules. So in other words, there's attractive forces between molecules because they're not perfectly shaped and there's some, uh, uh, one side of molecules is probably a little bit more charged, negative than the other side of molecules. So there's some sort of a, a cohesion attraction between the molecules. And we typically ignore that, especially when the molecules are far enough apart from one another. Those forces are very, very tiny and they don't really affect the situation, the, um, the equation that much. In other words, the pressure caused by the molecules pushing against the side is not really affected that much if the molecules are far enough apart from one another. But van der Waal recognized that if the gases are very dense, if there's a lot of pressure, the molecules are very close together, those things begin to make a difference and he wanted to have something that he can associate, that he can adapt the equation to so that it has more realistic values for the PV equals NRT e equation. We know that all the laws uh, regarding the PV equals NRT equation assume that it's an ideal gas. So everything that we calculate is always assuming that we have an ideal gas. And when that's not the case, we need to figure out how to make the adjustment for it. So here what he said was <clears throat> that the pressure that was measured was always going to be a little bit less than the true pressure of the gas. So we have to add some number to that to make it equal to the ideal pressure. He also realized that the volume that's measured was always going to be a little bit uh, greater than the effective volume caused by the real gas, so we have to subtract a small amount from that. And let me explain why. So let's say that you measure the volume of the container, okay, and let's say it's 10 liters, for example. Once you put gas in there, the gas molecules occupy a little bit of space, and so the effective emptiness of the container is actually a bit less than 10 liters. So the measured value, of the container is actually greater than the real value that the gas experiences in the ideal gas equation. So we need to subtract a small amount from that volume of the container. The volume here that we're subtracting is actually the volume of all the molecules added together. Typically a very small number, but under a lot of pressure it does make a difference. Secondly, he figured that the pressure measured was also going to be a little bit less than the ideal pressure because, as you can see here, as molecules bounce against the wall, they're being pulled back a little bit by the attractive force of the other molecules, so they don't slam into the walls with as great a velocity as they normally should if they're ideal gases. So the pressure measure is actually going to be a little bit less than the pressure we assume the molecules would have in an ideal gas situation, which means we're going to have to add a small amount to the pressure measured to get the ideal pressure. So the way you can look at it, and let me find my red pen here, is that the measured pressure is this value right here, the measured pressure, and then the ideal pressure is this. The ideal pressure that we need to have in order to have the equation work correctly. So this is the ideal pressure, this is the ideal volume. So if we, only, if we use measured values of the pressure and the volume on the very uh, what I would say dense gas conditions or very high pressure conditions, then the measured values plugged in here will not give us the quite, the, quite the right results. So we have to adjust it. So when we take the adjusted value and plug it into this equation, we do get the right results. And that's the whole idea. So ideal volume. Van der Waal and other scientists went ahead and started measuring the effects of the volume change and the pressure change due to different gases and so they came up with some constants, some particular values for the volume of each molecule and the attractive forces between the molecules which they, they can then use in order to adapt the equation. So what they also then realized was that this x, this unknown x, this additional pressure number that they had to add ended up being equal to this constant belonging to each gas times the number of moles of the gas squared divided by the volume of the container squared and to adjust the volume, they had to figure out the number of moles of the uh, gas that they had times some constant associated with the particular gas that calculates the volume occupied by each of the molecules. 
when they plugged in that for x and that for y, we now have a new equation that enabled them to come up with values for the pressure and the volume that they can then plug into the BV equals NRT equation that would be more correct. So, how much of a difference does it make? Well, let's do a little example. Let's say that we have, we want to know the change in the volume caused by oxygen molecules at STP conditions. So at STP conditions, they're not that close together. It shouldn't be a lot of difference. Let's go ahead and calculate it out. So the delta V is caused by, by this NB. So we have to calculate N times B for oxygen molecules. Well, let's say we have one mole of the gas, and one mole of the gas occupies normally 22.4 liters. So one mole causes a volume occupation of 22.4 liters for any gas, right? So that's the ideal gas condition. So plug in one mole, and then plug in the constant for oxygen right here, that would be liters per mole. So the amount of space oxygen molecules occupy would be this many liters per one mole of the molecule. Uh, and so let's plug that in here, uh, right there. And let me put units in because now you can see how it really works. So we have one mole of the oxygen gas, and we multiply it times the constant, which is 0 0.0318 moles per liter, or I should say liters per mole, otherwise it doesn't work. Liters per mole. Notice that the moles cancel out, and we have the result in liters. So we know then that one mole of oxygen molecules will take up this, this much space. All right? Then we're going to go ahead and plug that in here. So we have V minus NB. So the measured value is going to be of the container is going to be the V. The calculated value for the space that the molecules occupy is going to be NB. And so the effective or ideal volume will be this minus that. So this will be equal to 22.4 liters. Let's say that's the size of the container minus the space that the molecules occupy, which is 0 0.0318 liters. And of course, when we subtract that from this, we get uh, 21.3682 liters. So you can see that there's a very small change in the ideal gas or in the ideal volume that we need to use in order for the equations to come out correctly. If we do a ratio of that, let's say 0 0.0318 liters, which is the delta V divided by the original volume, 22.4 liters, we get a calculator. You can then see how much of an effect it has in percentage or in a fraction. So 0 0.0318 divided by 22.4, and that gives us... 0 0.00142, that's a very small fraction, turn into a percent, that's equal to 0.142%. So it makes a little bit more than one-tenth of a percent difference whether or not we take the ideal volume or the adjusted volume, understanding that the oxygen molecules take up a little bit of space, and so the actual value will be slightly less than the ideal value so we have to uh, make that adjustment. So again, to understand, this is the volume that we measure of the container. We know that the molecules take up this much space, so we have to subtract that from the volume in order to get a number that we can plug into the ideal volume of the ideal equation. Same with the pressure. We use A, N squared over volume squared, and we get an adjustment factor there as well. So let's do that real quick for the A, N squared over V and see how big of a change that makes. So we have a n squared over v squared and so for oxygen that would be uh, for a we get uh, 1.36 1.36 that would be atmospheres times liters squared divided by moles squared we multiply that times the number of moles and let's assume again that we take one mole of gas so one mole and we have to square that, so mole squared and mole squared cancels out. And then volume squared, let's say we put that in a container of 22.4 liters. So we take 22.4 liters and we square that number, so liters squared cancels out as well. So there we go. And what we end up with then is that we have 1.36 divided by 22.4 equals, oh, and divided by 22.4 because I have to square it. And so we have an adjustment factor on the pressure of 
2.7 times 10 to the minus 3 atmospheres, which is equal to 0 0.0027 atmospheres. And if you can see that, that's the ratio to a, a single atmosphere that oxygen molecules occupy at STP conditions for one mole. You can then see that the change in the pressure is only delta P is only 0.27%. So again, in the order of what we found in the change in the volume. So under STP conditions with oxygen, a little bit more than 1% change in the volume and a little bit more than 2% change in the pressure associated with the fact that we don't have an ideal gas. Not a lot under these conditions, but in the next couple of examples, we're going to show you how there's actually a significant effect with gases when the pressure becomes very high and the density of the molecules becomes very great. Then the van der Waals equation is really necessary to come up with some values that we can plug into the ideal gas equation to make the numbers come out right. And that's how you work with the van der Waals equation.